Welcome to Logger Lectures Online, part of our series of digital lectures presented by the McMaster Alumni Association. These in-person and online lectures are named after McMaster graduate Albert Abram Logger, a great believer in the value of lifelong education. He created the Albert Abram Logger Foundation, which supports several organizations in their efforts, including the McMaster Alumni Association. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this Logger Lecture Online. My name is Stephanie McClarty. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm CEO of Refficient, and past president of the McMaster Alumni Association. I have the honor of introducing today's guest, but before I do, I just want to remind you that questions are welcome throughout the presentation. We'll have a dedicated time at the end for our questions. We'll get to as many as we can and use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So you should see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use that for any questions. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, Mr. Ty Shattuck. Ty is CEO of McMaster Innovation Park, Canada's premier research park, where companies come to grow. Prior to joining the MIP team, Ty held senior leadership positions within the digital media, aerospace, and venture capital industries, including founder and president of Athon Technologies, CEO of PV Labs, and vice president of L3 Harris Westcam. Ty is well known within the local community for his business acumen and community leadership, and it's why we hired him to run MIP. In 2010, he was awarded Engineer of the Year from the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. In 2011, as CEO of PV Labs, he led the company towards being named one of Canada's top 200 fastest growing companies by Profit Magazine. And in 2012, they won an Academy Award under his leadership. You heard that right, an Academy Award. Ty has a Bachelor of Engineering from the Royal Military College of Canada and an MBA from University of Toronto's Rotman School of Business. Please join me in welcoming Ty Shattuck. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Uh, it's actually my honor to, uh, to uh, present the, this afternoon and I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be part of the McMaster family um, here at MIP. So I'm going to present to you a little bit about the vision uh, of the park today. Um, and hopefully give you a, a, a flavor of what we're doing and, and more importantly, where we're going. Um, so, so the first thing I'd like to do actually, uh, and I've been here at the park for about uh, almost exactly two years. And what I found is that once people get to know me, they, they actually take me aside and they ask me, well, what on earth, what, it, what exactly is a research park? What, what is an innovation park, Ty? So I've taken to starting my, my uh, discussions with kind of the foundations uh, research park 101. And I've taken to doing that at, using a Zen riddle. I'm supposed to be an innovation guy. So hopefully this will be um, uh, meaningful for you. So I'm sure so many of you have heard that Zen riddle that goes, if a tree fell in the forest, but there was nobody there to hear it, did it actually make a noise? So I actually have a modern play on that that says if a researcher makes a brilliant discovery, an absolutely brilliant discovery, but there's um, nobody there to hear it, if that discovery does not go towards saving a child's life, towards a feeding a village, towards making a brighter world, is that discovery really a good idea? And within that Zen riddle um, is the answer to what MIP is and what a relationship is to McMaster University. So McMaster, uh, McMaster Innovation Park is a for-profit company owned by McMaster University, but we're not actually part of the university. We're the crazy business cousin part of the family. And our mission is to, is to be a bridge between academia and industry. Um, and so our mission is that when there's a brilliant discovery made within McMaster or frankly made within any academia, academic institution, our job is to help bring it to life. Our job is to make sure that the world hears about it. Uh, it was Ralph Waldo Emerson that said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be to pass your door. So I've come to understand that uh, uh, Mr. Emerson was uh, very esteemed on many fronts, but when it came to commercialization, 
he really, frankly, was a bit of a fraud. The reality is when you have a great idea, a better mousetrap, uh, the world will not automatically uh, build, uh, build a path to your door. It's up to us to bring our ideas to life and bring those ideas to the world. And that's what MIP is all about. So our formal mission is to be a bridge between academia and industry. And if you can imagine a bridge, it's got two foundations. On one side of the bridge, you have academic uh, institutions, most notably McMaster University. Um, on the other end of the bridge, you have industry. And our job is to facilitate traffic in both, uh, both directions. So if you can imagine anybody within academia, whether that's a researcher, a student, a faculty, anybody within academia that has an idea that they wanna to bring to commercial reality, our job is to bring it to life, help bring it to life. You can imagine that Staples easy button that we're all so familiar with. My job is to make sure that they have this easy button that can help bring that idea to life, whether that's helping them find capital, helping them find business partners, channels, whatever it is that somebody needs to bring an idea to life, the park is where you can find those resources. And our job is to help do that. We call that an innovation ecosystem. And secondarily, and I would argue more importantly, is if industry is trying to tap into the intellectual horsepower within academia, our job again is to provide that staples easy button where they can easily connect with researchers, student, faculty, whomever, or, uh, or infrastructure to help bring that idea to life. And so what we're trying to do is promote traffic in both directions. Uh, with McMaster and academic institutions, the source of ideation, um, in industry and the source of, uh, of problems. The goal isn't just to have a bridge, but the goal is to help companies grow by providing this intermediary, this transition zone, which we call a research park. Um, and so the first point of differentiation, I would say, is that I pointed out, I said, our job is to help companies grow. Um, you'll note that I didn't say that this is the land of startups. So often a lot of people think of as a research park as a land of startups. And let me say that I'm a fan of startups. We have our fair share of startups. We have a couple of incubators, accelerators here at the park, but we are by no means exclusive to startups. Uh, we're also home to McMaster's Milo, uh, McMaster um, Industrial um, Industry Liaison Office, which supports license of technologies in large part to large corporations all throughout the globe. So we're home to that. Um, but we have a particular focus at, the, uh, at MIP that makes us unique, a focus on mid-market companies. And what does that mean? Well, and why is that important? Well, in 2017, 80% uh, of Canada's economic growth came from only 1.6% of our companies. I want to say that again. 1.6% of Canadian companies drive 80% 80, uh, 80 of our economic growth. And when you peel the onion and you look at the 1.6, a couple of things jump out at you. The first is not one of the 1.6 are startups. And do you know why? Startups don't actually create value. They consume value. Um, startups are a lot like babies. Um, they're tremendously fun in the early stages and when they're all grown up, they contribute to, uh, to society. But in the early days, my goodness, they're just noisy and needy and they consume a bunch of time and energy and capital. It's only, only after they become more mature, what we call scale-ups, that they actually create value. But in the early days, they're, they're not actually creating value, they're consuming value. Um, similarly, none of the 1.6% of the companies that drive economic growth are large multinationals. While large multinationals continue to employ a large number of Canadians, as a factor of growth, they're really not driving gro growth. They're actually declining. The reality in the Canadian context is the heart and soul of the Canadian economy is the mid-market, small, medium-sized enterprise. And historically, research or innovation districts throughout Canada um, and frankly, academic institutions haven't played nicely with the small, medium-sized enterprise. They've been this thing over here uh, that we know are out there, but we don't know, wanna, don't know how to tap into. And so our belief at MIP is while we support uh, startups and we want to continue to work with them, they're a necessary and critical part of the ecosystem. And similarly, we want to be working with tier one and large multinationals. If you really want to maximize impact, which is our mission, why would you ignore the heart and soul of the economy, uh, the Canadian economy? And so we have a particular focus on the mid-market economy. So the first point of differentiation is that we focus uh, not exclusively, but we have a focus on the mid-market. 
The second area of uh, thing that differentiates us is our sector focus. So we have uh, three areas of focus, just like anybody, any company. In our case, they're aligned with the research priorities of McMaster University, and they also happen to be the regional economic pillars. And so they're really important for driving uh, impact. Now, something that's really important about these three pillars, that these pillars, which are obviously, I'm sorry, life sciences and biotech, obviously uh, an economic pillar and a research priority for McMaster, um, is the first pillar. The second is engineering and advanced manufacturing. And while I say that's an area of focus, you could do advanced manufacturing within uh, biotech, within aerospace, within automotive, within a whole bunch of things. So engineering and advanced manufacturing is an area of focus, but it's applicable on just about any, any sector that we're talking about. And the third, ICT, information communication technology, um, that's, you know, we all hear about artificial intelligence and big data. So that's the third pillar. But it, again, is really applied to the first two pillars. Uh, the way I describe things here at MIP is if you wanted to go to a place uh, that's talking about next generation AI, something that may be commercially applicable in 10 or 15 years, I'm going to suggest that you're probably not best suited to come to MIP. You might want to go to Stanford, you might want to go to MIT, in a Canadian context, you might want to go to Vector Institute. Think people that are talking about what may, may be, um, you know, AI in 10, 15 years. But if you want to come to a place that's not doing next gen, but state of the art AI and applying it to life sciences, to aerospace, to automotive, to real world industries, that's what we're all about. And something that's really unique about these three pillars, that these are areas where in infrastructure matters. And what does that mean? Um, especially in this Canadian context, when we're all on Zoom calls uh, so many hours of the day, you realize that not all industries really need to have offices and meeting spaces all the time. So, if, so for example, in a fintech environment, you could see, and I have no more of a crystal ball than anybody else, that the world of tomorrow may not all be in office towers and stuff. And there's some industries where you can innovate without those sort of things. So for example, if you were an innovator that was making a new smartphone app, I'm going to suggest to you that you have no business coming to MIP. You're welcome to, but you probably shouldn't spend your finite dollars on rent at a place like at MIP or any other innovation park throughout the country or the world. You know where you should do that innovation? You should do it in your parents' basement. You need a computer, you need internet access, um, and you need a futon. So those are an example of industries where innovation doesn't necessarily need expensive infrastructure. But you know, there's certain things that you can't do in your parents' basement, certain industries where you actually need physical infrastructure. So you know what you should not do in your parents' basement? Nuclear medical research. Not unless you wanna visit by the Mounties, um, checking out what you're doing down there. You know what else you should not do in your parents' basement? You should not build a foundry and start melting metal derivatives and uh, you know, creating brownouts in the surrounding communities. These are industries where infrastructure matters. And in today's world, that's been ever highlighted. So not only these pillars of uh, McMaster's research, pillars of the regional economy, but these are industries where you actually need physical infrastructure to innovate. And those are the industries that we're trying to focus on. And frankly, what's happening here at MIP is a tremendous amount of success. While we are not as well known as some of our more famous cousins like Mars and Toronto and Commutatech and Waterloo, we're actually doing remarkable things. And we're also very proud to say that we're a self-sustaining innovation ecosystem. A lot of the innovation districts that you hear about that are better known are what's called regional innovation centers and they do great jobs and we have a local innovation factory, our local regional innovation center, but they're highly reliant on government subsidies. MIP is a for-profit company with one shareholder, McMaster University, but we bring in sufficient dollars that we're generally a self-sustaining innovation ecosystem. So our focus on mid-market companies, our focus on sectors where infrastructure matters, and our focus to create a self-sustaining innovation ecosystem are all things that we believe are important and differentiate us in this world. Now, what does the world of uh, tomorrow look like for MIP? So maybe we can take a step back. I know there's some folks uh, that were actually here in the beginning of MIP. This is what MIP looked like um, in the mid-90s. 
It's an old Westinghouse campus, if you're not familiar with it, but it's at the corner of Longwood and Aberdeen. It's a 58 acre campus. And again, it was Westinghouse facilities up in the upper left corner is what we call the glass warehouse. I'm gonna show you more of that momentarily. They made tanks and torpedoes in here. Uh, in the bottom left, uh, in the atrium building, uh, are remarkable things. So I meant you heard about L3 Harris Westcam. Uh, what people may not know is Westcam stands for Westinghouse Camera, and it was invented in this very building in 1953. Similarly, uh, digital hearing aids were invented in this, in this facility. Um, so this has really been a place of innovation and commercialization for over 100 years. Uh, McMaster University acquired the property about 15 years ago uh, with the vision of creating McMaster Innovation Park, this bridge between academia and industry. So that's what it looked like in the mid 90s. Today, fast forward, uh, we have three major buildings. The first is the atrium building at the upper top. That's where I'm sitting here right now. That's the old Westinghouse headquarter building. We also have the warehouse building to the left. Uh, we say it's one building, but it actually comprised of Mark McMaster Automotive Resource Center, the Advanced Manufacturing Center, Commercialization Labs for Early Stage Life Sciences, and the Biomedical Engineering Lab. And we also have CANMET, which is a national laboratory for material science. To give you a sense of the scale, we have about 700,000 square feet under management. And every day, well, every day in a, in a pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic world, about 800 people come to work here at the park every day. Um, and that's where we're starting today. Um, but one of the things that we find is to create a really dynamic uh, innovation uh, district you need both what's called critical mass and you need sufficient diversity within those people. And so 800 people sounds like a lot, but it's not enough to create an ecosystem. So as, as the park is moving forward, we have a couple of things that we wanna do. The first thing is we wanna add more people and we wanna increase the diversity of those people. So our vision of the park tomorrow uh, across the, uh, the 58 acres is that we wanna have 2.8 million square feet under management and we wanna have about 5,000 people working here every single day. And within that 5,000, we wanna have a real mixture of folks. So what I want you to know is we're trying to build a culture of innovation. We're creating something that the economists call spatial alchemy. Spatial alchemy is the art and science of placemaking such that people come together, uh, they do what's called collisions and they start to collaborate. So how do you create that? Well, you wanna create a culture. At the end of the day, we are no more about our buildings than the university is about its buildings or a hospital is about its buildings. The buildings are simply enabling infrastructure so people, people can do amazing things. And so what we're trying to do is that build the culture. And so within this park, um, with 2.8 million square feet, there's gonna be renovation space, there's gonna be new buildings, but there's also gonna be amenities. There's going to be restaurants, there's gonna be cool coffee shops, there's gonna be daycares, there's going to be you know, dry cleaners, everything to create a community. But what we're trying to do again is to create that culture. So for example, when we go to the restaurants, we could have gone to Kelsey's and they would have done a fine job of delivering burgers and pizza and beer to the folks here at the park. Um, but because we want to build a culture, instead of going to the likes of Kelsey's, we're going to partner with a local um, brewery that wants to create a beverage innovation and experience center. And the, similarly, when you come to the daycare, we're partnering with somebody that's actually doing research and applying AI to early childhood education. What that means is when you come to the park, everybody you meet, from the engineers and the scientists working in extreme sciences, to the people doing daycare, to the people doing dry cleaning, to the people serving you beer, they're all fellow innovators. The goal is that everybody at the park will be a fellow innovator. And it's that common thread that we're all trying to bring ideas to life that we believe will enable a culture of innovation and ultimately economic impact. It's exciting that the first phase of the growth of the park is a 300,000 square foot pandemic preparedness center known as the Global Nexus Project. So if you haven't heard about that, that's a McMaster initiative uh, to leverage the extreme research done by folks like uh, Jerry Wright at McMaster University to really bring to bear uh, the academic prowess to solve real world problems for today's pandemic is tomorrow's. But it's not just a building, it's an integral part of this ecosystem that we're gonna build.
And the economic impacts of building this park out are phenomenal. The Global uh, Nexus project itself will create 1,300 construction jobs and 1,600 full-time jobs. Importantly, the demographics of those jobs are aligned with the people most impacted by the pandemic and the economic downturn where we are today. When we branch that over to the park-wide development, 3,600 construction jobs and 3,300 jobs, uh, full-time jobs, again, of the right demographics. And we're gonna do this through private capital. So MIP is a private company. We are gonna do this through private capital to develop the park. And we're gonna have, hopefully, not just, we're not trying to build an island where everything is rosy here. Our job is to actually create economic impact throughout the region, throughout the province. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a virtual tour of what that park looks like. Um, and then we're gonna talk about our life science expansion. So this is a, a view of the park from above. We're gonna start a tour here, which is uh, at the north end of Longwood. Uh, we're gonna take a little trip south on Longwood. I'll pretend to be your conductor. We're gonna turn left, uh, look at some new facilities, and then we're gonna end right near the Canmet facility. Let's see. Uh... So again, to the left, you're gonna see the atrium where we are right now, where I am. To the right is a, a Hyatt Hotel. To the left here, you see uh, the beer garden, extremely important to support uh, beverage-driven innovation. There's the CanMet facility that's been around since for a number of years. Uh, to the right is the first high-rise, a multi-tenant facility. Mark is the McMaster Automotive Resource Center, largest automotive research uh, center in North America. To the left, which will break ground in the spring, is the Gowling's 100,000 square foot facility. AMC, the Advanced Manufacturing Center. There's even going to be residential at the park, 1,100 units of condos and long-term stays, and there'll be two hotels here at the park. Commercialization is early stage life science zones, being the biomedical engineering zone. We're going to turn left here. You're going to see biotech number two. That's a brand new 300,000 square foot new build biotech facility focused on startups. I, I mean scale ups, I should say. There'll be a brand new courtyard with an itty bitty fountain because apparently the architects got bored. Underneath all of this, uh, this courtyard would be underground parking so that you can go from each of the facilities to each of them without going outside. And in the distance here, this white building is the glass warehouse that I'm gonna to talk to you about because that's gonna be home for the Global Nexus project and will become the new heart of the park. So you can see additional residential. Uh, the yellow and black building just off to the left that we're gonna see is another uh, 88,000 square foot uh, ICT, Information Communication Technology building. In the distance, you can see some more mid-rise buildings. And we're just about at the end of the tour. Uh, where you can see uh, the Kenmet facility, which already exists. So hopefully that gives you a sense of where the park uh, has been, where it was, where it is today, and where it's going. Again, it's going to be 2.8 million square feet of facilities. So one of the things that I want to highlight to you is that we're trying to be a place to support scale-ups. And I'm going to talk about this glass warehouse in a minute. Within life sciences in particular, there's a need for what's called graduation space. So about 15 years ago, Big Pharma really moved to an industrial R&D model. The idea was instead of doing internal R&D, they were going to leave that to, uh, to research institutes, to hospitals, and to universities. And they're going to leave the funding of that uh, to venture capitalists and governments. And so about 10 years ago, it was all the rage to create startup space, life science incubators. And you see that in Toronto through Mars and J-Labs. You see that here at Beam and commercialization. It's happening in London, University of Ottawa's standing up space. It's happening throughout the country. University of Calgary is doing that as well. And that is phenomenal. It's great if you have a dozen or so people and if you need half a dozen or so lab benches. The problem that we have within the life science uh, ecosystem today is a function of that, that success. Where do you go where you when you have more than a dozen or so uh, people, when you need more than half a dozen or so lab benches? And the answer, unfortunately, is within Canada, almost nowhere. Um, that's not for lack of science. It's not for lack of talent. It's not even for lack of capital. It's a lack of physical infrastructure. So what we're trying to do at the park is be a home where companies can grow. Yes, to support startups, 
But back to that mid-market focus that I talked to you about, we want to be graduation space. So these companies, both that originate here in Hamilton, but throughout the region can come and grow here. Our vision is to create a life science mega hub. And the idea is it's bookended by the two best medical schools in the country, Mac at one end, University of Toronto at the other end. MIP at one and Mars at the other end. And what we want to do is take this corridor between those two things and create a dramatic, impactful life science corridor. If you've looked at what's happened in Boston and places like Pittsburgh, these uh, cities have transformed over the last couple of decades into life science corridors. And we have everything within this region to do that. We have the science, we have the uh, talent. All we need is the infrastructure. And that's what MIP is going to do that. The, the the first part of this is what's known as the glass warehouse, which will be home to the global, uh, global Nexus project. As you can see, uh, it's a bit of a fixer upper, um, but we have grand visions for it. So let me show you a little bit about that. That's what it looks like today. Inside, it's really quite a remarkable uh, bay. Each glass warehouse is the equivalent of a 30 story building ho line horizontally. When it's all built, it'll be 300,000 square feet uh, for the facility. And it's pretty famous. Some of our uh, some of our famous groups, like the Arkells, have, uh, have have done videos here. So this is my vain attempt to be associated with cool people. Uh, but it's really a remarkable building. And if you ever want to come visit it, we'd love to show you this. But our vision is to take the four bays that comprise the glass warehouse, some of which that go back over a hundred years, and we want to create something remarkable. I want you to know that my mission here at MIP is not to build the best research park in Hamilton. It's not even to build the best research park in Canada. It's to build the best research park in the world. And so that's what we're gonna do. And the, the heart of that is gonna be the new glass warehouse, the Global Nexus project. Um, what we envision is that each of the different bays will have a different theme, uh, labs in certain bays, offices, collision space, meeting space, conference space in other bays. And in the heart of the bay, we wanna create what's called the commons. Uh, this is where the restaurants, the amenities, and all of those things that are necessary to create a vibrant and dynamic place uh, exist. We want you, we want innovators, business people, venture capitalists from all over the world to say, you know what, we got to go to MIP because we want to see the research going there and we want to collaborate. And that's what we're trying to do at MIP uh, over the next five to seven years. And we want to make sure that the amenities at the park are everything that you need from childcare to gyms to all of those things that we're trying to do. At the end of the day, we're trying to build a culture around live, work, play, and create. The idea is minimize friction. Remember what I said about that easy button? We want it to be as easy as possible to find what you need, as easy as possible to find partners to help bring your ideas to life. If we make it as easy as possible, we're gonna maximize collisions. Collisions are what we're doing right now where different people come together and they bring their ideas together. And the vision is that if we're individually strong, together we're unstoppable. And this just isn't about Hamilton. This is about accessing the world. MIP is a gateway into the prowess, uh, ac uh, academic prowess of McMaster University, but any academic institution throughout the world. So through our networks of universities and through our networks of research parks, we can find financers, business partners, and sales channels uh, to support the growth of our companies here. And again, be the most impressive innovation district in the world. And that's our vision for MIP. Thank you so much. Stephanie, back to you. Thank you, Ty. That, that was incredible. And it's so exciting to see what's going on at MIP. I particularly liked your advice on what you should and should not do in your parents' basement. That's <laughs> great. There's lots you should do at MIP. So we'll shift now to questions. And I just want to remind everyone that you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to still ask questions. We do have some time. Our first question comes from David and Alfreda, and they ask Ty, what is the biggest hurdle you've overcome and what has been your greatest advance to date? So thank you very much for that question. Uh, you know what, I think, and, and, and let me say this is a work in progress. So it, it would be disingenuous for me to say that I've overcome a whole bunch of hurdles. Um, but you know what I would say is, is this, it's a Hamilton thing and frankly, it's a Canadian thing. Um, it's this willingness that we should think big and bold. Um, I'm a firm believer that the world needs what we have to offer both here in Hamilton, in this province, in the country. 
Um, and sometimes we like to sit in the shadows and see what other people are doing, whether we're sitting in the, the shadows of Toronto or sitting in the shadows of the United States. We have remarkable things to bring to the world and we need to walk with a bit of a swagger. And so if there's one thing that I would say uh, that I've tried to encourage within the team is that we should think big and we should think bold. And I think as our vision that hopefully you've, uh, you've seen and hopefully you find it compelling, I think, I think that's starting to take root. And that's certainly not about me, it's about the whole community. Um, I've been doing business in, in Hamilton now for, for over 20 years. There's amazing things here. And I'm starting to feel the groundswell that, you know what? We have a lot to offer. And that, that confidence, that willingness to take on big global media problems, that's something that I feel that I need to contribute to and I have, uh, hopefully, but it's certainly not just me. And so I would say that's the first thing that I think has been advancing and I don't wanna take credit for it, but it's something that I'm, 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 I'm proud to be part of that movement. The challenges, I, I think is everything, there's a two-sided sword. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have is that willingness to think big and boldly, that entrepreneurial spirit. One of the things that you see in a lot of companies is often we're, we're, we're convinced that we should put conservative forecasts forward and we should be humble in our forecasts. And it's a very Canadian thing. Let me suggest to you that investors aren't looking for a humble opportunity. They're looking for big, exciting opportunities. They're looking to change the world. And so one of the challenges we have is to get people to think big. So it's the opposite of what I just said. And with that comes capital. Um, you know, capital in my world comes in two forms, capital for the development of the park and capital for the fueling of the ventures. And those two things have to, have to exist. There's no use us expanding the park if there's nobody uh, here to fill it. But what I would say is, we need to develop funding. Uh, developing early stage funding in Canada is pretty good, uh, whether it's through government or angels or early stage VCs, but funding throughout the entire life cycle of companies is something that, that needs to be developed. Um, I think what we need to work on is how do we, there's what's known as the Waterloo model, where we create a company, get it to a valuation of about 20 million, then we sell it to a US company. Um, I think that works for the individual founders, but does that create a lasting impact, uh, a legacy? And I think we need to look at more inspired entrepreneurs that want to do bigger things, but we need to provide the capital and the infrastructure to support them a long way. And so that's part of what we got to work on as well. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve and he asks, how does one find out about the business opportunities and investments coming out of MIP? Because there's lots of exciting things, obviously. Yeah, so you know what? Uh, th there is a lot of different things going on in a lot of different areas. The first thing I would say, and you're welcome to reach out to our office. We have a venture services office that can point to, but it really depends where your interest is. If you're interested in early stage stuff, uh, we're home for The Forge, which is McMaster's uh, incubator, uh, and we have Innovation Factory. Normally those are a little bit earlier stage, um, but we would be able to connect you with there. Um, and it's also, if later stage is where MIP proper can help you more, um, but it was also depends on, on, the, uh, on the sector. So if you're interested in life sciences, that's very different than people that are interested in AI technologies. So what I would say is reach out to our office. We're gonna ask you some questions about where your stack bracket is and where your sector focus is, and then we'll direct you to the right folks to help you do that. But we, we can be your first stop. If you already know folks, go directly to them, but if you don't know where to start, reach out to us. And then how do they find you how do you oh, well, you go to www.mcmasterinnovationpark.ca uh, and reach out uh, at one of the info, I believe, uh, and we'll connect you with the Venture Services Office. Okay, that's great. So you touched a bit about learning from others, other entrepreneurs. Dennis asks, what can we learn from others, like other research parks? Yeah, so you know what, actually I've spent a whole lot of time kind of looking at what's happened in, in other research parks. So the first is how do you do it? Well, you go listen and talk to them and find out what, what they've done. And, and there's a bunch of, a bunch of lessons there. I, I'm gonna try to highlight a, a couple of them. And the first is, is this diversity thing. Um, often we think of innovation as the, as the domain of engineers and scientists and researchers. Let me say, that 
again, to my original point about, you know, um, a tree falling in the forest, that idea unto itself needs to, needs to bloom into something bigger. Um, and so you need to surround by other skill sets. So innovation isn't, um, isn't something purely technical. So just like you're not going to win a Stanley Cup with a team comprised entirely of goalies, even if they're the best goalies in the planet, um, you're not going to have commercial success if everything is just technical. So part of what you need to do at a research park is to have those other functions. Universities are where you have deep technical expertise within each of the, each of the domains. The park is where you start to go more general. And so what we need to do at the park is make sure that the park isn't just filled with engineers and scientists, but where are the venture capitalists? Where are the business partners? Where are the creative disciplines? Where are those other things that can help tell you story, help fuel your story and all of those other things? So to create, <clears throat> so the first thing I would say is you learn by these things, other parks, is to create this diversity, this culture. And that means it's not just about a bunch of buildings, it's about the people in the buildings and the culture of it. As so we've learned by that, whether you're looking at Boston, Cambridge, or Silicon Valley, or, or any of the other innovation districts. The other thing that I would say is um, have some patience. Uh, a couple uh, inspiring stories, at least for me, um, a Raleigh Research Triangle, uh, uh, on its 10th year anniversary, uh, there was a local paper wrote, oh my goodness, you know, the promises of Raleigh Research Triangle have not been realized, it's a, in a, it's a failure. That was it, its 10 year anniversary. They're now approaching their 30th anniversary and they are a pillar of innovation throughout the world. They're a hallmark. So I'm gonna suggest is that building culture, building infrastructure, building ecosystems, is not something that you can do overnight, it takes time. We're 12 years into our journey, which is somewhat similar to the Raleigh Research Triangle. So I'd say the second is, um, the second is, is, is to have some patience that these things take time. And the third is that it can be transformative. So we all think of, for example, uh, Boston uh, being a life science juggernaut. When they talk about Boston being a life science juggernaut, they're actually talking about Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and if you go back 25 years, Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, was known for drugs, um, not the kind of drugs that we like to promote these days, but they were known for drugs. Um, and it took about a $1 billion investment um, and they had a couple decent educational uh, institutions in the Boston area, um, but the combination of a billion dollar investment with dramatic or excellent academic institutions transformed Cambridge, Massachusetts into really a, uh, an economic wasteland into a life science juggernaut. So the lesson there is we have those ingredients. We have phenomenal educational institutions right here, McMaster, the most research intensive university in the country. Country. We have Mohawk College and look throughout the room. We have all of the ingredients. And so I think the third is to, is to drive that. And then the last thing I would say is pay attention to the problem. Um, we're, remember that bridge concept? Um, it's very easy to get enamored with our own science, with our own research, with our own ideas. At the end of the day, unless we're solving a problem, it doesn't create value. So I think it's the communication, the listening to problems that creates value. Uh, Stanford Industrial Park was created, um, you know, in and, and the, and the genesis of Silicon Valley by putting industry in a co-location with, uh, with researchers. And that communication created insight into the university where there was real meaty problems that created value and it gave industry, uh, industry insight into what was happening within academia. Now they also had a big bag of money for DOD, so that's the last part of it. So I think there's lots to learn, uh, but I would also say that we all have to have our own uniqueness. So Silicon Valley is different than Boston, which is different than what's going on here. And so we have to create our own our own vision, it has to be unique. There already is a Silicon Valley, Valley. we don't need another one, but there's certain attributes, the diversity, uh, the co-location, um, and, and the focus on solving big problems. Those are things we could learn, but we have to define our own vision. Absolutely, and when you're thinking out to, you know, being the best research park and knowing that it does take time, what's your planning horizon really? What's that vision look like over what kind of time span? So the expansion from 700,000 square feet to 2.8 million square feet 
Um, I'm going to say that's going to happen over five to 10 years. It's really affected by, by, by a couple factors, if you will, bottlenecks. Uh, the, first, the first is uh, you don't want to go down and if you build it, they will come. So the first thing is, is there sufficient market demand for the facilities that we're building? I'm going to say right now, I feel very bullish about it. Actually, I have an article here. This is about uh, life sciences in, in the US, but it's, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's called Life Sciences Land Rush. And what they're saying is there is an absolute dearth of lab space to support life science companies. That's going on right now. So I feel that at least, at least within life sciences, there's a demand for the kind of facilities, but that's the first thing that we're trying to do. Um, we, we have to be cognizant of. The second is availability of capital. Um, one thing that I've been surprised with, um, and this is where we maybe devi deviate from, from the main university, is universities, it's an 800 year old business model. They think in generations and decades. Um, so one model that we could do building by building and do the development of the park over you know, 20, 30, 40 years. What I've seen is that capital, if we're gonna use private capital, they wanna place big capital and do something dramatic. So it's actually, I thought the owner, Mac, would wanna go fast and capital would be, let's go slow. It's actually the opposite. Capital wants to spend the money fast um, and the university wants to go a little bit slower. And so I'm gonna say, in, in, when I go externally, I, I say over five to seven to 10 years is kind of the time frame that we're talking about. Um, and the third bottleneck is how fast can you build this stuff? Um, you know, it, it's going to take years to get through the planning and the zoning processes. Um, so, you know, it, it's not something you can do for a year. And any given building is about a three-year horizon. Um, and so I think it, over the next year or, so, year or so for both the Global Nexus uh, for 44 Frid, which is the spectator building, and for the new biotech building, I think we're in about a year or so of capital raising and then probably three to five years of, of construction building. That's great. So here's another great question for you. It comes from Mamdu Sukri, who's our former engineering dean and also the former York University president. And he asks, what is the extent of research collaboration among university, industry, and government researchers, as well as students' engagement? Well, it's good to, uh, I can't see you, but it's, I'm really pleased to hear that you're, you're online, Dr. Shukri, because um, you were an integral part of this, uh, this park taking off. So thank you for that. Um, so I think it's a little difficult. I don't know how to quantify the, the extent of it. Um, what I would say is it's okay, but it needs to be more. Um, I would say Mac uh, of the universities, uh, with all respect to York, where you've spent the last few years, Mac is the most research intensive university in the country, and those are in relative dollars. What I think is actually more impressive is the university leads in industry led dollars. And to me, that's a real sign that the kind of research that's happening in Mac is the kind of research and collaboration that really matters. Um, because industry is paying for it. That's the sign. If industry is writing checks for it, it must be important. So I think that's a hallmark for it. Um, but I would say there's always room for improvement. Um, MIP is all about that collaboration. And so we're always trying to work. And I know our, our cousins up in Milo are trying to improve and become more efficient. We're really excited that a spin out from the Faculty of Engineering, what's called Phi Labs, it was previously known as CERC, um, is really a brand new way to collaborate through uh, between academia and industry. Um, and that's been around for two years. Um, and, and we're about to uh, actually scale that dramatically. Um, Phi Labs is all about how do you overcome the hurdles? If you've ever been on the industry side and you tried to collaborate with a university, there's, it's always compelling to do so, but it's a little bit of a labyrinth uh, to work through the tech transfer office and work through the IP issue and find the right researcher to focus on the problem I have and make sure they're available and the students are available in the right time. Um, so there's, it's, it's hard to collaborate. Um, but I think there's movements both here at MIP through Phi Labs, which is to just streamline that whole process, not to replace the existing tech transfer office, but to, but to add an additional layer that focused on productization. I think that's good. And frankly, when you look at what's going on in other jurisdictions, changes to um, how people are viewing tech transfer are also very helpful. We're trying to learn from that. And the last thing I would say is the implementation of translational entities. Um, 
are an area that we want to do. So there's a view often that, you know, if you put a researcher in with a venture capitalist, then magic is going to happen. That is just a fallacy. Um, for the most part, a lot of research, it can be amazing, but it's too nascent uh, to attract venture capital dollars. And so you need to translate it or what's called uh, curate those ideas to a point that's interesting uh, for industry and uh, both from partnering and from an investment perspective. So McMaster's working on translational entities. Um, Phi Labs is working at Streamline and all of that is towards increasing the amount of collaboration between industry uh, and academic institutions while still being respectful of academic freedom and research priorities within the university proper. And we have one last question, time for one last question here. And it is, what opportunities might there be for someone with a background in clinical trials? Well, I would say that there'd be tremendous uh, opportunities. I think, um, remember what I talked about, we're trying to create a life science mega hub. Um, when you create an ecosystem, it's not all about discovery. It's ultimately about how do you take those discoveries and work it through all the regulatory hurdles. Um, again, we have all of the ingredients. If you think about, we have Mac, we have Hamilton Health Sciences, we have St. Joe's. We have the ability, and just within Hamilton, think about the broader region. We have tremendous capability. But frankly, having the ingredients doesn't necessarily translate into a magnificent cake. It's, it's got to be combined on that. And so I would say, um, as we build out these ecosystems, there is a real priority to improve collaboration between the hospitals, the colleges, and the universities, um, and private industry. And I would say uh, somebody with that background, you're at the right time at the right place, especially as we move from startups that haven't started to think about uh, clinical trials. When we move into scale-ups, they're going to be a big priority. So I would say pay attention to the companies at the park. Amazing. So that's all the time we have for today. Ty, thank you so much for updating us on what's going on at the park. And frankly, I acknowledge you for all that you've accomplished and, and the vision ahead. I'm sure your culture of innovation will produce amazing things to come. So thank you. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.